you know, we we wondered, is it harder to make a big deal or to not make a deal? I mean, were, were you weighing so much? Was it easy ultimately to to not make a couple of the deals that were proposed? Yeah, it's a good question, and I think obviously you prepare like crazy. Um, you know, for the deadline, um, <clears throat> there's, there's so much information that you need to, you know, keep in your head while you're talking to these teams. And, you know, we have a you know, great pro scouting staff, uh, you know, led by Andrew Bassett and, and Gary Chido. And this is, you know, this is their amateur draft, you know, just like, you know, Dan Kantrowitz, um, prepares for the amateur draft. I think this is, you know, pro scouting's draft and they, you know, we were very well prepared. I think we, we went into, um, the deadline saying, you know, if we can, you know, demonstrably improve our, our future, then, you know, certainly that's something that we will, we will consider, but um, yeah, we never, we never got close to that line. And so actually made the, the decision fairly easy in the end. Um, obviously, you know, you don't, you don't trade really good players unless you feel like you can stand up in front of the fan base and say, you know, our future has got a lot brighter uh, last year. You know, we had some deals lined up that we really felt incredibly strongly about. Uh, and this year we didn't. Um, I think we made some, you know, a couple of really good trades. Um, but I think that the ones that were, you know, maybe more expected um, obviously never materialized. And that's because they're really good players and we never got close to the right prize. Jed, so much focus on Wilson Contreras, obviously. And I just wonder, how would you describe what seemed to be from this vantage point, a disparity between what you thought Wilson Contreras would be worth in the trade market and how other teams across the league valued him. Yeah. Um, well, obviously we, we value Wilson a lot, uh, you know, given his contributions to the team and you know, what we know he brings every day. Um, I do think that market is a, is a tight market. Um, you know, uh, you, the relationship between a pitching staff and a catcher uh, during the course of a year, it, it builds and, um, I think a lot of times teams are reluctant to, you know, sort of, uh, you know, change, change catching mid season because of uh, the challenges of learning a new pitching staff um, in the middle of the year and things like that. So it was a tight market. I mean, you know, candidly, we, we had a feeling it, it could be, um, you know, we, we conveyed that, um, you know, to, to Wilson and to um, his representatives that, you know, this is, this is no sure thing. You know, I think, I think clearly, uh, based on the media coverage, there was an assumption that this was was definitely going to happen. But I think we knew that um, there was a you know, handful of teams that might consider such a transaction. But that we ultimately knew that um, it's not you know it's not like having a starting pitcher or having a having a relief pitcher where you know everyone can use a really good starting pitcher and everyone can use a really good reliever. I think people view the catching market differently, and uh, and that's kind of how it played out. I'm just curious. Uh, you talked about the emotional toll. When when the trade deadline ends, do you call Wilson? Does 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 who calls Wilson? Do you call Ian Happ? Do you have a conversation with them? You talked about that emotional toll. Do you, did you experience it in conversations with either guy? For sure. You know, it was kind of awkward because the the deadline was ending as like the game prep was was beginning for the game. So that those conversations had to wait till till later. We couldn't do it right like right before the game. Um, but yeah, we've we've had those conversations and. I, I really do empathize with um, both Ian and with Wilson and, and what they um, what they went through um, in terms of you know cameras in their face all the time and people focused on their departure and you know that's not easy I think that's not easy from a from a human standpoint to to think that you know any any moment you can get a call and have a new employer. Um, have to pack your bags, have to move to a new city, have to meet new people, have to perform in front of a new fan base. Like those, that's really difficult. And I think, I think a lot of times when we talk about these things, I do think that people kind of do lose sight of that, that, that aspect of it. And we just wanted to make sure we conveyed to both those guys that, that we, we understood that. Now, you know, we had also communicated to both guys prior to the deadline that, you know, this isn't a sure thing. And, and you know, we, we value you a lot. Um, you know, certainly we're not going to give you away uh, for a below average offer. And, and they knew that. Um, but I do think, you know, it's the snowball, you know, kind of got going down the hill and I think some of the coverage of the, of the trade market made it seem as though, like I said, it was a fait accompli that we were going to trade those guys. So I, I do think that contributed probably emotionally, but yes, I, do I, do I understand how difficult that must be as a player? Absolutely. Um, it's really difficult. And I think that, I mean, having 
you know, having traded, you know, having traded a lot, a lot of players, um, I understand like, you know, the family component that goes into that, the, the, you know, the emotional highs and lows that, that come with that phone call. Um, and, um, the best I can, you know, the best I can do is, is, is tell them that while I've never experienced being traded, um, myself, I, I do understand how difficult that, that can be. So Jed, to me, the big picture question is obvious now is because you both, both guys are still Cubs. You have them here for the next 60 games or so and into the off season. Are contract extensions possible with both or either guy? And if that's the case and they're still here, how does it affect or alter the big picture plan for the rebuild? Um, well, I, I guess, of course, that's possible. I mean, we've nothing's changed as far as, far as the fact that we're not going to talk about that stuff publicly if we're going to sit down with our agents and, and, and talk. Um, you know, we're not going to, we're, we're, we aren't going to, we aren't going to bring that up. And, and hopefully this doesn't become 60 days of asking, you know, what the, what the status of those things are. Um, it, listen, I've got you know really good relationship with you know, Scotty Pacino and, and Michael Stavall and, you know, those, those guys are great. And we, we, we will, we, we are, and we'll continue to, to talk to them about their players. Um, but we're not going to talk about, you know, where we are in the, you know, with a potential extension, you know, as far as, as far as the, the future, um, I mean, listen, I think, you know, obviously with Ian, um, you know, we, we, we definitely have him for next year. Um, you know, with Wilson, obviously he, he's a free agent and, and, and that process has to play out. But I mean, to, to me, the biggest, the, the biggest and most important thing is, you know, my goal is to build something that's really special. And I think that, you know, to build something that I believe can, can go deep in October and they can win championships. And I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, um, think that, you know, building something that I, that I you hope can, can maybe be respectable or hope can maybe sneak into a wild card position. You know, that's, that's not, that's not what, what snaps me out of bed in the morning. You know, I feel like um, when I look at, you know, my career and, and the memories I have, all of the, the truly great memories are from teams that either won a championship um, or had a chance to win a championship. And that's what I want to build here. And so we're going to work really hard to do that. And, you know, sometimes we're going to, we're going to make moves um, to try to make sure that we, that we line that up, you know, for the future. So that, that's the goal. Nothing's changed with, in that regard. Um, I think you know, we had a, a great run here for six years where we had a, a bunch of teams that, that had a chance to win a championship. One of them did. Um, we had several other teams um, that had a chance to do that. And that's what we're trying to build, we're not trying to build something that I think can sort of like just, just, just sneak in. That's not, that's not the goal. So uh, just out of curiosity, I know you don't want to talk about a contract extension or, or probably the qualifying offer, but when you are on the clock and you're talking to teams, you have to, you have to balance, you know, potential draft pick compensation, bonus pool allotment money that comes with that versus what the offer is. And, and you said the offer in your opinion was like pennies on the dollar, right? You would never, you could never correspond what you could get anyway with what was being offered at the moment. If, if I have that accurate. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the, the ruling on the international draft and the qualifying offer, I mean, I think that does have a, has an impact, you know, that um, you're all of a sudden you're, you're sort of given um you know, you're sort of given a floor um, of that value, you know, and right. you know that, you know, if, if um, you're not able to you know, reach agreement and, and extend, extend Wilson, that you know that um, you have the qualifying offer and you know that you have the, the draft pick that comes with that. So yeah, certainly that, that is part of the calculus. It'd be crazy not to, to factor that in as you, as you talk to different teams. But I think it's important that, you know, as you think about, um, the decision to hold both guys. It really was, you know, simply, you know, their value to the Cubs um, as, as players, as people, you know, that value um, far exceeded what we were being offered. And it's really, really that simple. So Jed, got to ask you this. It was a wild trade deadline. We saw Juan Soto go from the Nationals to the Padres for all those prospects and Shohei Otani was even uh, on the market and teams were invited to make their best offer. You're the president of the Chicago Cubs in this market. You should be ambitious. A lot of people wonder, would the Cubs, did the Cubs show any interest in either player? Because those are two of the top five players in Major League Baseball. 
Yeah, I mean, certainly I, I called, I, I, you know, I called, you know, Perry Manassi and I called Mike Rizzo. Obviously you have to check in, but, you know, I think right now um, in, you know, going into, into 2023 effectively, like, uh, you know, it did not, it did not make sense for, for us to be involved in the, the Juan Soto sweepstakes. Um, you know, I think you have to have a real structure, a real foundation built in order to, to make that kind of transaction. I think with the, with the Padres, they believe that this is their window and, and they are absolutely ready to, to win the World Series right now with him. And they, pri- they paid a really heavy price um, to do that, um, to get, you know, one of the, you know, the best hitters we'll ever see. You know, we're not right now in, in, a, in a position as an organization um, to do that. Um, now, you know, would we have, <laughs> would we have entertained that kind of thing in 2016 or 17 or 18? Absolutely. You know, do I look forward at some point in the next, you know, a few years to, to, to feeling differently? Yes. But right now, you know, certainly that the time wasn't, wasn't right, but it was, I commend the Padres. I mean, they got a, you know, a generational talent um, and obviously they gave up, you know, a big part of their future, but for the next you know, two and a half years, um, they're incredibly formidable. And, you know, having, you know, having worked in that market, you know, they've never had a, a major sports title there. And I think they decided that they're going to push their chips in and, and go for that. Obviously, you did make some trades, David Robertson, Michael Givens, Scott Efros. That might have been the most interesting one just because there was a feeling that you kind of helped him to get to this point through the pitching lab. Do you feel that the pitching lab can produce players like that regularly? Is that one of the reasons it made it easier to trade him? Oh, yeah, I, I don't want to you – know, Scott worked really hard and – He's a great story of perseverance, you know, and we actually talked about that on the phone for quite a while when we made the trade that, you know, his, his career arc or his career path is, is just so fascinating. And, you know, um, he was saying, you know, when he, when he uh, worked with Ron Vallone to, to drop down sidearm three years ago, you know, all of a sudden he was incredibly coveted reliever in the, you know, in the market to, to go win a championship in New York three years later, it's an incredible rise and he deserves, so much credit, not only for being willing to make the change, but also, you know, showing that, you know, from a um, emotional standpoint and from a, you know, from a you know, toughness standpoint that he is able to get high leverage outs. So I, I don't want to take credit away from him, but yes, I do feel like our pitching infrastructure is in a great place. We do believe that we can really produce pitching. Um, and for us, it was, it, it was, uh, you know, there's the calculus of, you know, right now, Scott Afros is a, you know, he's a high leverage reliever. Um, the value of that um, at the deadline is, is very high um, for teams that are they're trying to you know, play deep in October. And you know, right now we're we're not going to play in October this year. And so for us to get a uh, starting pitching uh, prospect that we've really coveted for for a long time, who's you know very close to the big leagues, it just made a lot of sense. And that has says absolutely nothing about how we felt about Scott Efros. Uh, it was simply uh, this felt like the the right the right move, you know, for the future of the organization. Quickly before we let you go, Jed, will we see Brendan Davis and or Miguel Amaya in Chicago before the end of the season? Probably not. No, you know, candidly. Um, I think with Miguel Amaya, um, he's been, been hitting great um, in Tennessee, but, you know, he's not going to be ready defensively um, to, to do that. So I, I think it's unlikely um, that we would, um, that we would do that since he, since he can't catch. And then with Brendan, you know, it's been uh, it's been a strange year for him. There's been good news and bad news um, you know, throughout the course of the year with his injury. I think the, the good news is is that um, you know the, the surgery that he had um, was not on you know was not on his his discs, um, and so really it's something we expect a, a com- completely full recovery from. He's just he, we need to get him back and and kind of um, get him the at bats that he lost. Um, in the minor leagues, and then hopefully we'll figure out what he can do this fall so to, to make sure that he didn't uh, kind of stall his development by not getting enough play appearances. But, I mean, listen, the future is um, really bright for both guys, and I, and I do think that, you know, it, it's um, it's exciting to me that, you know, so many good things have happened in the farm system this year, and two of our two of our best prospects, you know, Amaya and, and Brennan have been hurt, and even with that, I think we've, we've really seen some great advances. So, um, the future is bright for those guys, but I think that's probably probably unlikely to be in Chicago this year.